Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so excited to welcome you all to another Explorer Classroom. At National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and of wonder and of storytelling to change our world for the better. And as we're watching protests against systemic racism in the US, we ask all of our viewers out there to, to join in that movement. Today, we're supporting the actions of hashtag shutdown academia and hashtag shutdown STEM. So to our educators and our young explorers out there watching, we encourage you to take some time, do some research and plan how you can help improve your communities to ensure that everyone is safe to explore the wonders of our world. And this past Monday, June 8th, was World Oceans Day, which is a day for people all around the world to come together and celebrate our ocean, learn about it, and figure out how they're going to protect it. And on Explorer Classroom, we did not stop on Monday. We're <laughs> celebrating a whole week of ocean awesomeness. So today, we're very lucky to be joined by Justine Amendolia, whose work helps protect our ocean and all of us by, by extension. She's a marine biologist turned plastic detective, and today we're going to learn all about our work and how you can all help with it. But before we get to that, I would like to acknowledge that we are joined by tons of students up on the screen with us today, and even more on YouTube watching from all around the world. Today, our registered students represent Arizona and Brazil and California and Canada and Florida and Hawaii, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Massachusetts, Maryland, Mexico, Minnesota, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, Romania, Texas, Virginia, Washington. I bet Ben from the UK is out there. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Um, and probably many, many more people and places. So if I've missed your state or your country, or you'd just really like a shout out, feel free to say hi in the chat bar. We'd love to say hi back. But for now, it's finally time to turn it over to Justine for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Thank you so, so much for attending today. I'm really, really excited to be here, especially during Oceans Day slash week slash month. Um, a lot of us marine biologists get so excited to get out to classrooms, especially virtually, and share all that we know with all the kids around the world. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to start off by sharing my screen uh, and starting the presentation off. So you guys can all see me. So like Celeste said, um, I consider myself a marine biologist and a plastics detective. So what, what, is exact, what does that mean? I, as a marine biologist, I'm really fascinated by animals that live in the ocean and trying to understand how they make a living and how they're able to survive and you know, live this very um, ocean oriented lifestyle. And then also, um, I'm also considered a bit of a plastics detective because I'm really interested in understanding what kind of garbage gets into our environment. Now, the thing is, is that I started off um, as a young kid, really interested by animals and wanting to study them for my whole life. But what ended up happening was when I went to go study birds in a place called Greenland, I learned about how plastic pollution was becoming a huge threat in our ocean systems. And this kind of led me to think about how can I make the ocean a better place for animals to live? And that's where this picture comes in. Uh, I'm in the middle of a garbage dump which you wouldn't expect uh, for a marine biologist to be doing. But the thing is, is that it's really important to understand what kind of garbage is being created by humans so that we can figure out better ways to prevent it from getting out into the ocean. So that's basically what I do. So with my talk today, I'm gonna to talk about how I became a National Geographic Explorer studying birds and then how it led me down this really amazing path uh, to study garbage and plastic pollution. So I'm gonna take you right to the beginning. Um, I heard there's some Canadians in the crowd, so uh, welcome to this, guys, and I'm, I'm glad that there's someone else in the country. So for those of you who don't know where Canada is, uh, we're just above the United States, and I'm calling from uh, Toronto, which is Canada's largest city. In this city, we have millions of people, and as you can see, we're pretty far off from the ocean. We're right in the middle of the country, and the thing is, is that even though I was so far um, away from the ocean growing up, I found a way to, find, or to fall in love with it. And this is me at five years old on a trip to Florida that my family used to take. And literally, I just remember throwing myself in the water and dunking my head under just with, with a pair of goggles on to see all the fish that were swimming at my feet. And I just remember that moment of feeling so inspired and curious and um, by all these different animals that lived in this magical underwater landscape. And you know, from five years old onwards, um, throughout elementary school and high school, I really wanted to do this. 
And I actually did find a way to kind of pursue this passion and love for the ocean by going to college and studying marine biology. This picture of me was taken when I was living on an island for three weeks uh, studying corals uh, through my college program. And for me, this was absolutely life-changing because it was just an older version of what I was able to do when I was a kid in Florida. But, you know, as great as the tropics were, for me, I was always really curious about kind of studying an ocean close to home. I wanted to understand what were the oceans like in the Northern Hemisphere, um, meaning anywhere that's like far up north, um, where the water's a lot chillier, and also around Canada. So around the end of school, um, when I was about 22 years old, I ended up applying for a National Geographic grant. And what a grant is, is basically a pot of money that allows you to go do a project. And for me, my project was about as extreme as you can think it was. It was to go all the way to a place called Greenland. And if you can see on the map over here, Greenland's all the way in the north, um, kind of near where the North Pole is. Um, that's right at the top here. And the field site that I wanted to go study and go learn more about the animals that live there was this little sliver of land here. And this place was, was called Cap Hogue. The thing with this magical uh, location was is that nobody actually lived there full time. Instead, this was home uh, to about 2 million birds during the summer. And you're probably thinking, what are birds doing all the way up in the Arctic? The thing with uh, seabirds are these are birds that are specially adapted towards living in our oceans. They actually find it really, really uncomfortable to live on land. They, they don't like coming to land. In fact, if they could live all, all year out on the ocean, they would because there's plenty of fish. They're uh, specially adapted so that they can live on the water. But when they come to land, it's a really awesome time for biologists to kind of go visit them and, you know, study and ask questions. And the reason why they come to land is that, you know, like during the spring, how some birds will, um, like robins will lay eggs and, and little chicks will be hatched. That's exactly what seabirds do too. They come to land to make these massive places where they can uh, raise chicks. So my adventure started off with learning how to charter a helicopter. And if you've never ridden in a helicopter before, I would definitely recommend it. It is super, super cool. And the field site that I was at, you know, required because there were no roads in this country called Greenland, um, a lot of the travel to get out to see animals requires um, helicopter um, travel. One thing with Greenland is it's a country the size of California, so a big part of the US, and it has less than half a million people. So there's not too many people living there, but there are, but there is a really rich culture. My field site was all the way on this cliff here. This is where the birds lived, and this is where they were raising their chicks. And if you can see all the way down here, this tiny little spot is where I lived for six weeks with three other people. Now this cabin, had absolutely no um, lights. So I couldn't flick on a switch and get lights. Um, there was no running water because you know there were no pumps out there. So the interesting part about living in this really amazing place was you know, having to eat a lot of canned food, which is over here. Like we had to eat a lot of canned fish and crackers because we weren't able to get vegetables and groceries. We, we basically had big trunks of canned food that we ate for over a month. And for water, we melted ice, and that's what we were drinking every day. But my favorite part was actually the toilet. <laughs> if you can see this here, this toilet had the best view I've ever seen, uh, even better than places where I've slept or like traveled to. It was just such a beautiful sight. And as you can imagine, sitting on this toilet, I, if you can picture two ends of the water kind of on either side of you in a full mountain view range, one thing we had to watch out for when we were up in Greenland was polar bears. So actually, when you're using the toilet, you're just constantly worried that a polar bear might visit you and interrupt you during your time. So other than the toilets and the canned fish, my, the birds that I was studying were really the highlight of my, my trip. These guys are called little auks. And if you know what puffins are, the birds with the really colorful beaks um, that, are, that catch lots of fish to eat, these are like their cousins. They don't have colorful beaks, but what's really awesome about them is their size. They're about the size of a can of Coca-Cola, so really small, but they can fly for kilometers and miles and miles into the ocean. And what's really interesting as a biologist is trying to ask questions about how these birds are able to do it. How do they get so much energy and so much fish and um, little shrimp in such a short period of time to actually raise a chip? Now, my question was to ask, where were the birds going off in the ocean? 
So what I what biologists do is they use little, they use little cheat uh, ways to cheat because we can't actually fly to go out into the ocean to follow the birds. Instead, what biologists use are little backpacks like this one here or GPS trackers that mark where the birds are going off into the ocean. So that's what my project started off with was putting backpacks on birds to see where they went. But the catch was, is that I actually had to take off all the backpacks when they came back so that I could get all this information and, and all these numbers. The problem is with science is that it is so messy. <laughs> Nothing ever goes right and people don't tell you how uh, difficult it can be. So what happened was when I put the backpacks on, the birds flew off into the ocean and they never came back with the trackers. I literally had no project. And if you can picture flying all the way to this country, Greenland, getting on a helicopter, living in a place for six weeks without any electricity or running water and then not having a project, it made me feel really sad. And I remember thinking, okay, how am I gonna change my project to make sure that I can come back to National Geographic with something? And what I decided to do was instead of studying where the birds were going off into the ocean, was to study what they were eating instead. And the only logical way I could do this was by collecting bird poop. Yes, lots of stinky bird poop samples, over a hundred to be exact. And the reason why that you collect bird poop is that you can trace in the laboratory what kind of item, what kind of prey and fish and shrimp that the birds were eating. So I ended up saving my project and it taught me that to be a scientist, you have to be really creative. You don't have to just be smart at statistics or numbers or math. You have to be really, really good at problem solving. My office and the place where I lived for six weeks was basically this view. And every time I look at it, I still get really, um, like this feeling of awe and just wonderment with how beautiful nature is. And one thing, you know, living in this place taught me is how we have to respect nature and the environment because places like this are few and far between in our worlds because we're so, we, we develop everything as humans. One thing that really saddened me when I got back home was I learned that the birds had actually been eating plastic that summer. And it really, really um, kind of made me realize that, you know, if I was going to be this problem solver and marine biologist, I wanted to find a way to get to help um, the birds have a cleaner ocean to live in and generally improve our oceans and our environment. So what I ended up kind of switching gears to with my with my job was to study garbage. And it might not look like the coolest thing at first, but trust me, guys, garbage is so incredible with all the different colors, shapes, and sizes, and how it can integrate itself into any kind of environment on our planet. These pieces of plastic I, I collected off a beach one by one, and you can see they're all like part, they're all broken up into chunks and bits and pieces. They were all part of things like buckets and pots and shoes and uh, packaging, but over time when they're in the ocean, they get broken up and beat up until you get a lot smaller in size. So microplastics, which I'm sure some of you have heard about before, are super tiny pieces of plastic um, that basically next to a coin can be very tiny and you, you need a microscope to see them. And this is where our problems are with plastic is, is that at the end of the day, when they get this tiny, animals can eat them. And that's not good for our environment or for the animals living in the ocean. So when you see plastic this small, you have to be a detective. You have to understand where is it coming from because at the end of the day, how can you solve the problem if you don't know where, where, where the source is? So that's what led me to become a garbage detective. <laughs> so you can see here, I'm on a beach picking up garbage and it wasn't what I thought marine biology was, but it's been something that I've been really passionate about because it just means a cleaner ocean for everybody, for the animals and the people. So I lived in a place called Newfoundland, Canada. Um, I showed you where Toronto was before and Toronto was all the way back here. But Newfoundland is an island that's as far east as you can get in North America. It's a chilly place. We have icebergs in the summer and we have puffins and we have beautiful uh, whales that come and visit us every year. And what was beautiful about living in Newfoundland was the fact, look at all this coastline. You can be on a beach and you can check for garbage, you can check for animals. It gave me a really great opportunity to understand what we were up against with this plastic problem. The job I was doing there was really fascinating because what it involved was hitting the beach every single week for two years. And by hitting the beach, I wasn't building sandcastles and playing games. It was literally weeks of garbage picking. 
And you can see here, um, there's like little ropes and these ropes show us the section that we looked at every single time. And what we did was we checked these beaches over and over again to see what kind of garbage was ending up there and trying to picture and puzzle or put together these puzzle pieces of where was the garbage coming from. One thing that was really special uh, being a scientist in this kind of place was the fact that there's houses all behind me. You can see over here, I'm literally in people's backyard. And what's really awesome about that is that you get to have conversations with people about the garbage they're seeing. And being a scientist, it, sh it showed me that being a scientist doesn't mean you have to be in the lab by yourself uh, being super smart. What it means is that you have to be a good communicator with people. You have to get to know people's perspectives and understand different parts of the puzzle because you can't really make good action to protect the environment without including people in the equation. So that meant doing a lot of beach cleanups, which I'm sure some of you have done cleanups in your own communities with your schools or churches or um, youth groups. And it's been a good way to you know, make those connections between what we know as scientists and what the, the communities know. A lot of plastic that we found was called single use plastic. Some of you might have heard about it before. That's like um, if you use a straw for McDonald's or a water bottle or even drink like a, uh, a soft drink or unwrap plastic from food. This is what single use plastic is. But the thing is, is that we didn't find too much of that on the island where I lived. Instead, what we tended to find a lot of was actually fishing gear, which made sense because every community we went to go survey had really, really deep ties to the fishing culture. People would go out on weekends, they would go get the fish for dinner, or that, that that was their livelihood. Now, the garbage you see me holding here is a fishing buoy. That's what uh, fishers use to attach to their traps. And it's super cool um, because we never found something that big before. But what I want you to focus on is the rope. You can see this rope isn't, isn't quite right. It's puffed up and it's all frayed at the top. And that happens when you leave plastic out in the sun for too long, it puffs up and it explodes. And then it gets really frail, almost like a cracker, and it, it um, shrivels up into small pieces. Now, what was really interesting about my garbage detective skills was that it required taking ropes like this and being able to identify what happened to the threads and connecting those dots of where the plastic was coming from. And we were able to solve the puzzle of all those little threads all over the beach by looking at the bigger pieces of rope. So it's really important in plastic detective work to look at all the garbage in the environment and start to connect the dots in between each and every single piece, almost like you're solving a big puzzle. Now, one thing that we used a lot with our work and I, I like to use as an explorer is called citizen science. That means that anybody in the world who wants to be a scientist, does it, it doesn't mean that they have to go to university and do degrees, but it means that they could do my job if they wanted to. If they wanted to hit the streets right now and then go paint a picture of what plastic looked like in garbage, they totally could do it just with the right resources. And what I mean with those tools is that, you know, there's a lot of tools available for people to become citizen scientists. One that I love using is called the Marine Debris Tracker app. And this technology is a mobile app that anyone can get on their phone, it's free. And you don't have to live in a coastal environment near the ocean to use it. If you live in a town in New Mexico or you live in a small um, in Phoenix, Arizona, anywhere in the world, um, you can use it and track the different types of garbage that you're seeing. And what's super cool about it is, is that there's pictures with everything. I absolutely love pictures because it makes everything so much more exciting. And you know, with this app, what's great is you're almost like on a scavenger hunt. Um, for me, like for example, with COVID, I've been going out for a lot of walks because unfortunately, you know, I've shown you these great pictures of these, all these amazing field sites I've worked in, but like everybody else right now, I'm stuck inside. Most of Canada has shut down. And the problem is, is that I can't go do the field work that I was supposed to do in Alaska this summer. I'm kind of stuck in the city. So what do you do? Using citizen science and making observations around me, um, you know, I found projects to keep myself busy. So one thing I'll explain about this, as you can tell, it's a big old garbage truck. And in Toronto, there's over 6 million people in the area. So that means a lot of garbage. And that means you can, you know, walk around the community and see what kind of garbage is around and, you know, put together these puzzle pieces of understanding where is it coming from. 
Now for me, doing field work is really exciting because I work with really great people that I get to make connections with and do really good science um, with uh, during really tough situations. And for me, one of the coolest parts of doing um, community work right now, looking for different types of plastic in my own community, is that I get to work with my girlfriend. Um, Jackie Saturno is also a National Geographic Explorer. And what's great about it is, is that as a couple, uh, we both study plastic pollution. So we're both very nerdy, <laughs> um, we're both women, and we get to hit the streets of the community and look for all these different types of garbage, all this different type of garbage that, you know, is making up the streets and trails and even um, parking lots of our area. So right now with our garbage detective work, I find myself adapting to COVID and instead of crying over the fact that all my plans went wrong for the summer, I get to, we, uh, me and Jackie get to find all these amazing discoveries, things like finding uh, what kind of garbage is occurring with COVID. And one thing I'll quickly share is, is that we're finding a lot of gloves and masks and all these different types of debris in the community. And what's really awesome about this, it's not great that there's pollution, but there's ways to so stop it. So I know most of you here are probably staying inside and trying to do as little as possible. But one thing that we can all do our part in is to use reusable masks in order to um, reduce the amount of single use plastic. So all that plastic get, that gets thrown out from disposable masks and also wash our hands as much as possible. So we don't have to use gloves, but Basically, I mean, I've showed you kind of what I'm up to right now, and I hope you guys have some great questions for Ocean Week, and I'm so excited to hear them. Thank you so much for your time, and yeah, I look forward to your questions. Justine, that was amazing. Thank you so much. I think that most kids out there are probably familiar with cleanups, right? They're comfortable going out and picking up litter, but I don't think most people naturally think about where that litter is coming from in the first place. But if we understand that, we can figure it out and help stop it from getting there in the first place. So cool, so wonderful. Thank you for sharing your plastic detective work. And also just the way you're able to keep your momentum and make the best <laughs> out of really inconvenient surprises. <laughs> keep following us in our, in our scientific work, right? It's such a cool lesson to learn from. So thank you for all of that. For those of you learning along at home, we would love to see what you're doing with this and learn what your favorite part was. So. Maybe you're going to do a follow-up activity from the family guide, draw a picture, write a story, go out and do your own plastic pollution survey, whatever it is, we would love to hear about it. You can send it to us on Twitter by tagging at NatGeoEducation and using the hashtag Explorer Classroom. That way we can make sure Justine gets the chance to see all of your cool work. And now it is time for questions, the best part of the day. If you're watching on YouTube, Keep sending those questions in in the chat bar. They're looking great so far. You only need to send each question one time. We do record absolutely everything that you send us, so please don't spam us. Um, and if you're up on screen with me, start thinking of your questions and get ready with a nice loud voice. I will let you know when it's your turn. Our very first question for the day comes to us from Kid Conservationist, who is wondering what the hardest part about living and working in remote Greenland was. <laughs> To be honest with you, waking up at 3 a.m. every single day, I have to say, I like to sleep in, but the problem is, is that when you study animals, your schedule doesn't matter at all. You, you have to follow whatever the animal's patterns are. So there, one thing to, to highlight in Greenland is, is that there was, during the summer, there's no night. It's 24 hour sunlight. So you, we had to uh, tape garbage bags up on the, the window so that we could pretend that it was nighttime. But yeah, it was totally waking up in the morning, even without the like nighttime, it was brutal. <laughs> that is a relatable problem, yeah. I love that. <laughs> and let's go to an on-screen student for our next question. Let's visit Anian and Thile and see what their question is. Go for it, guys. Um, how many gloves or masks have you found? <laughs> that is such a good question. Um, I'm, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 500, I want to say, 500 pieces of garbage. So that's also including the wipes. So like the disinfectant wipes, um, you know, the ones that are soft and they have like um, cleaner on it. Those ones are actually all plastic. So they're not paper, like a tissue is, for example, like this, this will degrade in the environment. It's okay. But like the disinfectant wipes are all plastic and people, you know what they're actually doing now because they don't know is, is that they're flushing them down the toilet. 
So even though I only, like Jackie and I only found 500 items, the city, cities all over the map are saying, please don't flush plastic down the toilet because it's gonna clog up everything. So even though we're only finding a small piece, a small amount of plastic, there's lots of plastic everywhere coming to this. Wow, that is important information to know. Yeah. That's such an easy takeaway. Everybody can go yeah. tell their family that little tip. Yeah. Um, we've got so many questions coming in online, um, but one of them comes to us from Connie S who was wondering, how did you get that bird poop if the birds kept flying away with the backpacks? That is such a great question. Um, okay, so when you study birds that aren't you know, they're not like cats and dogs in our houses where you can pick them up and kiss them. No, it's wild animals. You have to be trained in how to, to how to get them and hold them. So one thing that biologists do is they set up little carpets over rocks and they're called uh, car like carpet traps. And what happens is when the birds land on these little traps, they get their feet stuck there. And when they when they're stuck, you can go and pick them up and hold on to them. And the really interesting thing about uh, birds and trying to get samples from them is that, you know, they're not going to poop if you ask them to. It's, it's really tricky to get them to give you samples. And I was trying to figure out in the field, okay, how are these birds going to give me the samples? Like, am I going to have to scare them a little? Am I going to have to squeeze? Luckily for me, I didn't even have to do anything. The birds, as soon as you hold them on a notebook and you just hold them very, very gently, and you're about to slowly release them to fly off, they usually like to take a poop anyways, because that means they weigh less. And that means they don't have to carry as much weight with them when they fly off into the ocean. So if you're ever looking for a bird to poop, tips. <laughs> Gross, I love it. <laughs> awesome, well, let's go to uh, Katya for our next question. Katya, go ahead and unmute and ask away. Oh, oh no, Katya. I know we tested your microphone, but now we can't hear you. Mm -mm. Why don't you chat me your question and we'll keep working on it. Why don't we jump to Hadley for now while, while Katya works on his tech? Um, why do you want to know how to stop the synthetic material from um, spreading to every part of the earth? That's such a great question. To be honest with you, there's a lot of things that, like for example, when we started making a lot of oil and we started burning a lot of gases and stuff, at first it didn't seem like a problem. It was great. We had all these cars, we had all these buildings, but now we're starting to see the effect. Of oh, no, now we lost Justine. Oh, can you hear me now? Perfect. Yeah, yeah. we got you back. <laughs> Sorry about that. So yeah, with climate change, it took us 40 years to really get a handle on like how our planet's changing. And for me with plastics, I've had a huge privilege going out to these beautiful parts of our planet. And we see the alarm bells everywhere that this is gonna be a big thing to worry about in the next 40 years from now. And the problem with plastics is, is that as we start reducing the amount of oil, a lot of that oil right now is going towards making more plastics and we're increasing so much and we're producing a lot more plastics every year. And we, we don't really get that message of like, we need to slow down and, you know, stop making so much. Why do we have to wrap everything in three layers of plastic when it, when the problem is, is that living in Toronto now, I'm connected to rivers, which connect to the lake, which connect to the ocean eventually. So whatever happens in a city will eventually hit the ocean. Awesome, such yeah. such great reminders. And let's see, Katya, let's try your mic again. I'm crossing my fingers for you. Oh, he's muted. Oh yeah, there you go. Can you hear me? We got you, go for Perfect. it. I was pressing the mic off button. So have you ever found an owner that the trash you found belongs to? That's such a good question. And how many did you found? Hmm. I haven't actually found anything that I could link back to because the problem is, is that when plastic gets lost in the ocean, it can spend years and years and years floating around in a circle and eventually it might hit the beach. So one thing that I found really, really cool that we found um, was actually these little tags and they were called fish tags or, or lobster tags. 
on the East Coast, you put a big trap inside the ocean and you catch lobsters with it and crabs to eat. And for example, the government put little tags on each of these traps and eventually they come off over time. And looking at the year, you can identify where the tag came from, but you can never identify the owner because it years like they'll float around in the ocean. And we actually found a tag from 1977 before I was born and before any of us here for the most part were born. And it's, it, you know, you it's really, really hard to trace stuff back to owners. Wow. All right. And we've got LK Hawkins in the YouTube chat bar, who's wondering if there are options outside of plastic gear for folks who like to fish or maybe fish for a living. That is such a great question. That's one thing that a lot of scientists right now are working on. Back in the day, uh, we're talking like before 1950, so like ages back, they used to use cotton and hemp or rope. So hemp is a type of material from plants and cotton is obviously also plants. And they used to use that kind of rope to catch fish. And that was great because it wasn't plastic. It would break down over time and it would um, biodegrade. So that means like it wouldn't just break up. It would just like fully, like the ocean would absorb the nutrients there. And the problem with that was, is that it got so expensive when plastic came around because plastic was really cheap to make. So right now there's options to go back to cotton but the prices are really high. And the problem with fishers is that they don't have a lot of money. Like fisher, you don't go into fishing because you want to make millions of dollars. You go into fishing because you love the ocean. It's tradition that's passed down from your family. So one thing is, is that you can look into cotton now, but I would sit tight for the next few years because there's going to be a lot more options, I think. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And let's take our next question from Abby in Hawaii. Go for it. Oh. Hi. Okay. So my question is, is that everybody loves to focus on single use plastics. Yeah. I was wondering if we got rid of single use plastics, how much of the problem of all plastic would be solved? That is such a good question, Abby. Oh my gosh. I haven't heard that one before from, from an Explorer classroom. Um, you know what? Thinking about it, single use plastic Okay, so if we're looking at a big circle of how much plastic's created in the world, about one, um, we'll say 25% of that problem is mostly single use plastic. A lot of plastic is actually created for a lot of different things out there. So, you know, when we build houses, for example, we use plastic in all different parts of the process. But the problem is, is that when we put plastic in a house, like if it's in our refrigerator or if it's in our floor with like the different types of tile, that plastic is used for 50 years onwards in a lot of cases. Like people hold on to their floors and their houses and they don't get rid of it every day. Single use plastic, is it scares me a lot because we throw it out so quickly. With a bag, it only has a life, it only lives for 10 minutes in our use. So we'll get it from the grocery store and then we'll throw it out. And the problem is, is that when we're creating millions and millions and millions of one type of item, we, we have to be careful with that. So single use plastic is a great way to start off, but then, yeah, you're right. We have to think about the other plastics too. Awesome. We've got Krish online who's wondering what the favorite part of your job is, Justine. Oh, that's such a good question. To be honest with you, if you asked me before COVID, I would have said traveling uh, and like, well, I was supposed to go see, I was supposed to be at National Geographic at, in Washington, D.C. three times before this happened, and I was supposed to hang out with Celeste, but the problem is, is that, you know, if you ask me after COVID, even though I miss traveling a lot and meeting all these awesome people and seeing animals, I really, really enjoy asking questions and feeling like I can change things by showing parts of the environment that people don't think about. If I can get people to care, like all of you guys on the screen now, all you folks, about one little topic that you didn't think about before, and that'll change how you, you know, take a bag or you say no to a straw, that for me is way more fulfilling than getting on a plane and going somewhere. So yeah, definitely asking questions and being able to do something with that information. Awesome. I think Mary has a question. Mary, go for it. Go ahead and unmute and ask away. Um. So uh, what's the biggest piece of plastic you've ever found on the beach? Oh, that's such a good question. 
Oh my gosh. Um, let me think about that for a second. The biggest piece I've seen. You know what? So when people go fishing, uh, they have these big boxes, but they're like, they're massive. Like if you can see one, like my whole arm stretched out like this, right? Um, these boxes are filled up with fish after fishermen catch it. And a whole box ended up on the beach. But what was really cool was that we were able to go back to the area where they fish and bring it back to them um, and give them like the bins again so that they could reuse it. Because a lot of the fishermen were fishing close to the beach where we were doing surveys. So yeah, really, really big pieces of fishing garbage. But you know, in, in a lot of cases, that garbage isn't really garbage because fishermen are quite resourceful and they'll use things over and over, even if it's broken. So I would say they like, yeah, they're pretty good about that. We have a question from Laura Aston, who is wondering if you've ever found real life examples of some of the more viral plastic pollution images. Have you seen a turtle with like the can ho holder around them or, or any of those other iconic images? Yeah, I know that's such a great question. To be honest with you, I haven't, but I wouldn't want to because I would be so sad and like that would, I, s I see how plastic impacts the environment even without seeing those animals there. And I can only imagine every time like I picked up a certain type of garbage, like for example, um, you know, the, the, the packs to hold all the cans and stuff, the ones where they show turtles getting trapped in it. Every time I picked one, one of those, I'm like, okay, at least another animal's safe for a day. Um, picturing of what could happen really scares me more more so than yeah, actually seeing it. And one one thing too is is that like now people are starting to say see that like face masks are tangling up birds in Canada. Like one one person reported that. And for me, every time I pick up something, it's like a good reminder that it's out of the environment and away from the animals for now. Awesome. Yeah. We've got username Seth the cat who is um, wondering what you personally do in your own home being a plastic detective to limit your plastic use. For sure. That's such a great question. I love the like practical ones. Uh, reusable bags straight away. Never. I, we, we never have plastic bags in our house. Um, one thing too is, is that, um, I, most of you guys, I, most of you folks, I'm sure that your parents get your groceries for you, so you don't have to grocery shop. But one thing that we tend to do is buy in bulk a lot. So instead of buying plastic wrapped, uh, coffee, for example, or tea that, you know, are little tiny packs, we'll buy like four pounds at a time, either without packaging through a bulk store or just buy it with one single like type of plastic. So then that way it's not adding extra packaging. Um, another, op another way to kind of improve on your plastic footprint is by refusing, which is a little harder now. So if, if any of you have had like pizza, for example, um, and you went to a restaurant and you ate it there, you, you can't do that anymore, right? You get everything delivered to your house um, because a lot of the COVID steps. And I don't, I'm not gonna say like, don't, you know, go out for food if you want to, because everyone deserves a treat during this time. But, you know, packaging from takeout takes a lot of plastic away. So before COVID, we really didn't have too much of that in our house because you could bring your containers to reuse. But for now, we have to kind of just make sure everyone's healthy before we, we move on. Awesome. And I'm sure our students at home have heard the reduce, reuse, recycle, but I love thinking about refuse and rethink and that. That was so cool. Thank you for that. And I know Delara has a question. Go for it. Okay, so um, my question was, um, hold on, have you, was it ever embarrassing to use the bathroom in the wild where like the people you lived with could just easily see you? <laughs> That's such a good question. Um, to be honest with you, there was an unspoken like rule was like someone would say, I'm going to use the facilities and you know they were going to poop, but like there, it was just co common practice. You wouldn't go around and you wouldn't spy on them because that's weird. You're, you're stuck with someone for six weeks. Uh, and one thing is, is that if we heard screams, then we would have to go out because, oh no, what happens if there's a polar bear? But we were really lucky because no screams. And also there were no windows on the cabin in that side. So it was total privacy. But yeah, that's such a good question. And also, I mean, the thing is, is like, it's common in the fields to poop in really weird spots. Like I've been on ships in the middle of winter where you're just rocking back and forth and like using the washroom is the biggest pain in the butt, literally. 
it's yeah so biology can be a bit tough in very unexpected ways no <laughs> lots of times we've, we've got oscar torres who's wondering if you're planning your own trash pickup how many people would you recommend do you have any tips for that oh that's such a good question depends what kind of trashy area you're targeting you have to assess your scene first and my advice, if any of you do community cleanups, I would wait a little longer just because both my partner and I are both biologists. We're pretty safe about how we're picking things up. Still not really a safe time right now with COVID. So sit tight for a few months. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't want anyone getting, because get, the thing is, is trash can be dirty in like more than one way. So yeah, just don't jeopardize your health. But when you go out to an area, it depends what you want to clean up. Do you want to go do a parking lot? Do you want to go do an area near the river? you wanna assess how much garbage uh, is there, right? So, I mean, you can do a cleanup with two people. I would always recommend going in pairs so you have a buddy system. Um, and then, yeah, like just, you can get as many people as you want, but just make sure you have enough supplies. So even though we say we wanna make sure there's no plastic, without we still need gloves a lot of the times to pick up garbage because we wanna stay clean and healthy and safe. Um, so you have to make sure you have enough gloves and enough garbage bags and things like that. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And I think Ms. Burke, a sixth grade teacher who we have up here with us and her students has a question as well. All right. Well, again, thank you so much. I love your enthusiasm. Um, it comes through the screen for my students. <laughs> um, and I love that you talked more about um, what your life was like in the toilet. So yeah, pretty good. <laughs> All good. Um, so my students and I have been looking for ways to get data. Um, yeah. my, my students did e-cyber mission projects last year and we had a number of groups who wanted data on microplastics, mm. which was really challenging yeah. to get. So I'm curious if you mentioned the one app, which I think was called Marine Debris Tracker, which is new to me, yeah. but if you have other suggestions for how students could get data, mm. um, kind of take charge. See, and that's that's such a great question. Thank you so much for, for attending Ms. Burke and your class is an absolute delight. Such great questions. Um, yeah, so with getting data on microplastics, the tricky, um, that's usually like a lot of scientists right now are kind of holding on to their data nice and tight, just because um, it's really, it's it's very expensive to do the lab work and all that with microplastics. I would suggest putting them in the direction of macroplastics, like the bigger, the bigger stuff, the nice um, pieces of like uh, single use plastics and things like that. And you can easily access massive data sets from Marine Debris Tracker for free. Uh, you just go to the get data app or like option on their website and you can type in locations you're interested in collecting, uh, you know, who was picking up garbage where, and also um, what dates you're interested in getting them from. So if you wanna look at certain years, uh, you can do this close to home too. I mean, you can even get your students, obviously when it's safe um, to do cleanups and collect data. But another option too that I've been hearing is a lot of people have been reporting things on Marine Debris Tracker without picking it up, just to make sure it's, it's okay during COVID. So if you wanna do an assignment where you get them to mark like 10 different types of garbage around their, their houses, um, you can access that data and do a lot of cool stuff with it. So, yeah, <laughs> I hope that's helpful. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Justine. You are such a wonderful example of an explorer. As our longtime viewers know, explorers appreciate and respect the diversity in both the human and natural world and understand that each individual and each ecosystem is connected and super necessary for everyone else's survival. Um, is there anything that you would recommend for students at home as they as they go out and start trying to use their their voice and their actions for good? Totally. Oh my gosh. It's easy to feel sad during this time. And it's totally okay if you guys had amazing summer plans to go to the beach and do all these fun things. And now it's you you're stuck at home and everyone is in the same boat. So don't feel too bad because we're all suffering in our own. The thing is, is that you can use your backyards to do so much cool learning and exploring and things like that. I would recommend, you know, using a cell phone and taking good pictures of what your life is like now. You know, talk, if you write a journal on like what your life is like during COVID, because this is a very weird time in history. So your, your like experience is really interesting as is. And then also, you know, make observations about your backyard. When you go out for walks, 
notice when flowers are opening up or what kind of bugs are flying around there. Look at the birds that are around you or the different types of garbage if you're interested on the ground. There's so much you can do in your backyard right now and you're in such beautiful parts of the world. So yeah, don't worry about missing out on the beach because that, that'll be there when everything gets back to normal-ish. <laughs> Amazing. And do you have any general advice for the young explorers out there who maybe want to follow in your footsteps and enter science or exploration as a career someday? Yeah, um, totally. I think that anyone who's thinking about science, I was never great at math. I was always like really like I would see math and I would freak out and start like getting nervous. But that didn't stop me with the career I chose. And if you love it enough, you'll learn it. So don't let anything scare you too hard. And when, if someone says that your grades aren't good enough, don't listen to them, just keep on going harder. Cause yeah, a lot of people who are really, really good scientists weren't the best at school. So yeah. Of that, such cool advice. Yeah. Well, for folks at home, you can check out Explore Classroom and many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. Uh, be sure to check out Marine Debris Tracker, like Justine mentioned, and be sure to share your work with us on Twitter. I hope to see you at some of our upcoming events. We'll be right back here tomorrow at two. And I also want to announce that next week, the week of June 15th, Explore Classroom is going to begin our summer schedule. So we're going to move to broadcast twice a week, every Wednesday and every Thursday throughout the summer. Happy Pride Month, everyone. And I'm going to turn on everybody's microphones before we let uh, Justine go and end our broadcast. Let's say goodbye and thank you nice and loud. Everybody, you can turn on your microphones. Ready? Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.